Well, I definitely don't like stopping conversation. That's, uh, that's why we're here for one of the reasons, is to enjoy each other's company. So I'm glad to see all that. Uh, but thank you all for being here tonight on this Wednesday. <coughs> Give us a few more minutes as we find our seats. Having some slight technical difficulties. At least we can see that one. Um, I won't be able to see that one up there, so I can't do anything. No, I still got right here, so we're going to move on with class. This is lesson two of our series that we're going through on the nature of God. Uh, last week, we just looked at why study the nature, uh, you know, why look into that, um, and kind of a basis for what we're going to be doing. And today, uh, tonight we'll be looking at uh, the names of God. Now, I know Eddie went through a pretty extensive uh, lesson series on that. Uh, so we're going to fit all of that into one, <laughs> one night. Uh, but again, like I mentioned, kind of our motto is we're looking at the nature of God. And I want this to be a class of not just looking at the aspects, right? You know, like I said, there's a textbook answer for all of these. What I want this to be is a personal look because uh, we need to have a personal relationship with God. So I send out questions. We have thought questions. Uh, the things that we'll be thinking about is how does this apply to me and how can I get closer to God? Well, that's not. You get to see my notes, I guess. Oh, I can see it back there now. Maybe I'll escape. We'll try that again. Start. Well, if it doesn't work. Well, there we go. That's good. There we go. Yay. <laughs> um, well, let's get started with a prayer. Let's also remember, uh, as it was just announced, that Josh and Lacey, uh, Keith, they are on their way right now. Uh, I know there's still some things maybe uh, that they need to have answered. Um, it's a preemie, uh, but please keep them in your prayers as they're on their way um, into to Arizona. Um, and is there anything else that I missed that we could pray for right now that that, uh, you know, that just came out of emails that I may have missed. Uh, if not, um, uh, Eric, would you please offer a prayer so we can get started in this class? Dear most heavenly Father, we humbly bow before you now, Father, and thanks for this opportunity that you've granted us to gather together to worship you. Can everybody hear me okay? Just make sure in the back, yeah. Good. All right. Before we get into kind of the basics or the uh, the basis of what we're going to be looking at tonight, uh, let's just start off with this question that I have put out. We have the questions um, that we're going to go through, but this is one of the thought questions, which is usually about two of them at the end of all the questions, uh, which those are kind of you. But I wanted to go over this one um, 
and hopefully you know, got some answers here, but why do you think it's important to know and understand these names of God, even though they were spoken and used long ago in Old Testament times? Charlie? Well, they're descriptive, so they help us understand God. Descriptive. I was like that. Trey? They still describe God. You know, God chose to describe himself in those names, and he hasn't changed since then. There were several times where God said, I am called, or my name is. And so when we're talking to our Father, talking to God, it is good to know what his name is. One thing that's also important about it, it helps you to feel um, really what the power of fellowship with him is all about. Because right. there's so many times when people, their faith begins to waver. It's because I think they've forgotten who God really is. And so this is always a good reminder. Right. And the describing words, we're going to go through quite a few of them. Um, so God is not just a God, um, you know, and he's not, you know, you think about like the idols uh, that, you know, Paul went to Athens. There was an idol. There was some kind of thing that they were worshiping, and it'd be for the rain, it'd be for the land, it'd be for, you know, fertility, whatever it might be, right? That's not what God is. God isn't a God of things. He's God of everything, and these are descriptive words to help us understand, just like how he describes or tries to describe what heaven is going to be like. We can't comprehend it. This is as close as he, we can to being understand, and that's why he has so many descriptive words, because God is all of these things. So, anything else? Yeah, Jeff. Deb. Right, covers all bases. Sad, happy, you know, whatever the range of emotions that we can have. Glenn? The name of God helps us to get an image of what God is. His power, His strength, and His presence. So, when we think of God as being our rock, we think of stability and strength. Because it's all one His name. Right. Same things, you know, God Most High, we'll get into, right? That's somebody who's looking over us. Right? I sees everything, knows everything. Right? These descriptive. God is love, right? And what does that entail? So looking at just in general the names, the importance of names, of course, we have, you know, in Genesis 2.19, we have one of the first tasks that Adam is given is to name the animals. Um, and he's given whatever he names them, that's what it's going to be. But that's kind of what we do as humans, is we find things we need to codify it, right? We have numbers, we have letters, things to help us. And this helps us to talk to one another, describe things, give things, uh, you know, measurement, whatever it is, right? So this is something very basic. And uh, Bible names, and even I think, um, you know, the, the lesson here, if you look through it, right, it's changed, but I still think that it has significance. Um, I, you know, we're a little shorter on time this evening, but like, for an example, right, I, Will's name is William Michael, right, and I chose his name when I was 11 years old, so I don't know if that sounds weird, but my name's Michael, I was named after my mom's brother, who went by Mike, his name, full name was William Michael, he died when I was 11, and he's one of those people that I looked up to as a true and honorable Christian man. Now, he died of AIDS because he had made some choices in his life earlier that led him to that disease. And I saw him, you know, when he was, you know, he'd be 42, I think. Um, he was two weeks before he died, and here's this man, less than 100 pounds, couldn't use the left side of his body. And here's an 11, 11 year old, maybe I was 12, I can't remember exactly, but looking at this, but I remember that he found out what it, what it was, that he was going to die. And he went to all the churches that he had ever visited throughout his life. Because his dad, my grandfather, was a preacher. And he went there and he did lesson after lesson. One sermon called Choices. And he used himself as an example. And from that point on, I said, no matter what, my firstborn son is going to be William Michael. Because I wanted to honor that. So we have these biblical names that they would do and it would be honoring to God. Now, we all... I think we, you know, can easily go on the websites and find what our names mean. You know, Michael, one who was like God. 
right? So that's, that's kind of a cool name, right? That's Michael the Archangel. Um, and we can do that, you know, biblical names, similar things, right? Abraham, Sarah, Nabal, <laughs> that's my brother's favorite <laughs> fool. Uh, you know, you got Cephas, stone, rock. Uh, you got Sarah, her name was changed to Sarah, meaning princess. Abraham, meaning uh, multitude, father of a multitude. So these names, right, and you have also Gabriel. Uh, we'll get in, you know, if you saw that, Gabriel, uh, Ezekiel, so anything that ends with the E-L, right, that's that L, that's that base L, God. So it has to do with God. So names definitely have some significance, and I'm sure that you picked, you know, that your parents picked names for you that were significant in some way. But there is one name, and we're going to go, and I mean that a little bit, you know, both ways. <laughs> There's one person, one entity, one thing, one person whose name should be revered above all others, right? His name wasn't chosen by anybody. This is just who he is. And we'll get into a very specific name, his personal name, and what that means. And I like this, um, and we'll get in a little bit later. Uh, into the next couple of verses after this one. Uh, but in Exodus 3.13, then Moses said to God, Indeed, when I come to the children of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? This was an important thing, and God answers. So before we get into that, what does it mean to take God's name in vain? Um, and the second question, you can answer either or together. Why must, must we never take God's name in vain? First off, it's commanded not to take God's name in vain. <laughs> commanded. <laughs> it's in the Ten Commandments, right? It's there. You shall have no other gods before me. I shall be holy. To make it vain is to make it common. And we are in no way supposed to make God something that is common supposed to hold him in high reverence for who he is and his majesty. I like the way that the writer of this puts it. It drags it, and I like it, it drags it below a common level and puts it in a position to be ridiculed and mocked. So it not only just puts it there, it drags it, it pulls it. It's not supposed to be there. Anybody else on why? I mean, you look at, you know, of course we have it commanded, but you know, Psalm 111, 9, holy and awesome, or the word can be translated reverend in the King James, is his name, right? It's the same thing, you know, there's a question there about why shouldn't somebody be named reverend or father, right? Well, that name, reverend, father, that's supposed to be for only one, and that's our father, right? Our reverend, our God. Uh, you have also Deuteronomy 28, 58. God's people are to fear this glorious and awesome name. Exodus 27. This is why God's name must never be taken in vain. Anybody else on that? I mean, it's pretty obvious. I mean, they're, they're, it just, you shouldn't, but try them. Yeah, I was just going to add, not only do we make it common, if we do that, we disrespect God. Uh, because his name defines who he is. We shouldn't even use Eucharist. I mean, we right. being a teacher, uh, being the teacher of the class, you start to go down these all these rabbit holes and it's like, I can't use that. We don't have too much time. But one of the things was um, in Hebrew, like Hebrews today, uh, writers, um, you know, the, the tradition was uh, that you don't even say God's personal name, which we'll get into in a second. But they even got so far today that Adonai, which we'll see also, that they don't even write that anymore because it's so reverent. They just put the name. <laughs> as far as when they're writing it. Uh, another one that I saw that was interesting is once you write any of God's names, that you're not allowed to erase them. So I thought that was interesting. That's how much reverence they have for those names of God. All right, 
Oh, yeah, yeah, go on. We have to be careful with our euphemisms that claim it's on. G, yep. right, all these other are variations of people. Right. It's right. It, it, we're trying to. We're even trying to make it even less. Right. It's. It doesn't help. So hopefully people looked at this one. Uh, this was a fun little one. So uh, Elroy. God who sees. What? God who sees. God who sees. I'm, I'm going to try and say El Elion. God most high. Uh, Eddie can't answer all of these. <laughs> Theos, that's the Greek word. Just the, yeah, the generic name for God. Pahad? Here. El Shaddai? Almighty God. Yahweh Sabaoth? Lord of Hosts. Curios? Oh, I already skipped it. Lord. <laughs> Finger got too quick. A beer? Mighty one. And El Olam. Everlasting. Everlasting God. And there's kind of the list of them. Uh, and we're not going to go through each one and any verses. You have the material. Again, I should mention, if you don't have this material, please let me know if you didn't get on that email list. Uh, I just I want to make sure everybody has this so they can you know, be prepared and just have it for future reference. And then really quickly, the Greek names that were there. Uh, so Theos, uh, God is where we get our terms theology or theocracy, which is a, uh, a government run by, say, like the Pope. Um, it's mostly used to refer to the one true God when we have it here in the Bible. And then you have Kyrios, Lord, also uh, Master, and it's the Greek equivalent to the Hebrew word Yahweh or Jehovah. Okay, so now we're getting these three major names. So we're getting, these are the ones we're going to be focusing on. Elohim. So, is Elohim a singular or plural word? Here's the plural. easy one. Plural. plural. Uh, anybody know the singular? Eloi. Eloi. Eloha. And what does this teach? So let's go to Genesis 1.26. Should be a very familiar verse that we know, and I've definitely quoted it many times, or at least keep it to memory. Can somebody grab that, please? Read it and say. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So here's that first kind of entry of God's names. You know, and of course, we have in the beginning God created. That's definitely the first one. But here, this is definitely into the nature of God, of who he is. So we have here, let us make man in our image. What does that mean? And what does that tell us about God? And what about the us part? Well, there's uh, there's a Godhead uh, operating in, in unison. Um, you know, the image is singular in our image. So right. The us is referring to the Godhead. Right, and that's why you know we have the word here Elohim. It's plural. We've got one God, but multiple personalities, three personalities: Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. And I always love this verse about let us make man in our image. So we are made in the image of all three personalities, one God, our God, the Creator, but we have all three of these within us as far as what we should be doing, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and that's how we go out into the world. That's how we shine our lights. So as we look at this, Elohim really gets into this. It's about God's power in creation. Let me get these actual. Because it, it says, um, and you have it in Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. 
in the beginning God, Elohim, that's the word there, created the heavens and the earth. Um, and this comes again, like we said, the El comes from that very generic one, but it really comes from this power, preeminence. And I like this, what it says in here, there's certainly nothing unreasonable in the supposition that the name of the deity was given to man in this form so as to prepare him for the truth that in the unity of Godhead there were three persons. So this is a plural word, plurality of persons sharing the essence of deity, one God, three personalities. Anything else on Elohim? I mean, I went through that quickly, but... So, on the next one, we looked at... Moses asked God, what name should I give them? And here we have God's answer. And I included verse 15 as well. Uh, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus, you, thus shall you say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And this is my memorial name to all generations. That sounds like a pretty powerful name. But I am who I am. So here we have Yahweh. Now it was originally written as this YHWH, which... Uh, it's called a, what, a tetra, tetragrammaton. Did I get that right? <laughs> um, which they weren't sure about how to actually pronounce it. Um, and I think a lot of Hebrew you know, scholars think that it comes from this hava, meaning to be, or just being. And that's God. He wasn't created. He doesn't have a father. He doesn't have a beginning. He doesn't have an end. He just is. I am. Right? You know, there's always, you know, I think, therefore I am. That's not God. He just is. Now, it's still a hard concept, I think, even, you know, to wrap my mind around, that God just is. And I don't think I'll really fully grasp it until I see him. But that's as best as he can describe it. And when Jesus said the same thing, I am. Right, he's talking about, I wasn't, I wasn't was, I just am, all time. I am the Father, or I am the God of Moses, continual. And it's the most commonly one used 6,800 times. And this expresses God's eternal existence. So why is Yahweh a special name for God? Actually, I think I've got two questions there. I thought I fixed that. Why does Jewish tradition, let's start with that first one. Why does Jewish tradition require speaking another word in place of Yahweh? So you don't use it in vain. <laughs> Very good. So you don't use it in vain. Just like I was saying before, you don't even want to erase it. Um, you have to be careful with this. You have to give it so much reverence that you're placing it with something else. And when they're speaking it, what was the, anybody know, what's the word that they would replace it with? So they didn't have to say it and wouldn't be careful with it. Adonai. Adonai. There we go. And why is Yahweh a special name for God?
right. And even the God, you know, the, the fathers that you speak about that have passed away, they are in your past. They're with me. They are current with me. And I think that's important for them to know that you hear about all these stories, you read about it, they're passed along from generation to generation, but God is saying that they are currently with me here, and you need to continue this story of them, right? Sometimes I think uh, we, you know, because we have time, <coughs> that when things happen in the past, you know, we have our family, we have our generations, that we sometimes just think of it as history, uh, that it's just complete, that we're done, that we're moving on. Part of that's true. I think, though, when we're talking about God's story that he's putting us on here for and our purpose, we're continuing a story, and we are connected to all the way back to Adam. I love that, that we're connected to Adam. We're connected to Abraham, to Moses, to all of them. Because of God, I am. He connects us all together if we're all, you know, we follow him. Anything else on that? Really quick. Oh, Charlie, yeah. One reason he always has special names by definition, there is no one else that's deemed right. to him, not created, always has been. Uh, it's Satan himself, our most powerful foe, can't match, no one can match him. Right. And just like in, again, like Paul in Athens, there isn't just some an unknown God that we don't know anything about, that we're just going to place it on there just to be sure that we've covered all everything. No, God, God and God alone covers everything. So yeah, it's a special name for the covenant relationship with Israel. Adonai is using its place to avoid using it in vain. Um, hallelujah, we sing that a lot. That's praise to Yah. Uh, Elijah, Yah is God. I mean, names just like in the E-L, right? Michael, Gabriel. The name is in there, right? So it's that part of it. And when we sing hallelujah, right? That's another way of us giving praise to God. And I like uh, Jehovah. Uh, it was a Latinized combination of using the consonants of Yahweh and the vowels of Adonai. Gary? It's important to note, and you mentioned it earlier, but take these things and then what Charlie said. That's why in John 8, they were so angered by what Jesus said. Yeah. He was claiming that exact same equality. Right. And that's why they said blasphemy. That's the way they're calling him a blasphemy, because he was invoking this reverend's name that they had so long for generations held in such high esteem. And here's Jesus who is part of that, because when it says, let us, right, when they ask him, he says, I am who I am. I'm, I was there. In, in Exodus 3.15, where it's, where it's I am, and he goes to say, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God there is El Elohim as well. Yeah. So when he says, he's God, says, I am, it's Elohim. I am Elohim of Abraham, of Isaac. Of right. God. And it'd be interesting, like, Jesus, I don't know, if, I don't think he ever came out and said it, but before he became man on this earth, he was, you know, he was probably seeing Abraham and Isaac on a regular, like, he was there with them while they were waiting. I don't know, that's maybe my conjecture. But. Anything else on Yahweh? So now we get to this Adonai, which here we have it as an A-Y I know a lot of places will have it as AI. Um, I think it's just interchangeable, right? Just English versus Hebrew kind of thing. So what is the meaning of Adonai? This replacement word, name for God, so that we can keep Yahweh in reverence. Lord, Master. Lord, Master. It's... It's a word that's used, um, now it can be, I think they can use it uh, in more of a common way. Uh, I think we have here Malachi 1.6, maybe uh, references human masters. Um, but really, you start looking at it with, in terms of God, and this is the Lord, the master. 
So what about that, Lord and Master? What about that? What is for us? What should that be the meaning of when we think about that word, that phrase? Anybody? We are called slaves. We are slaves to him, so therefore he is our master. And we're slaves to something. Yeah. We're slaves to something. And that's the same thing when he was talking about, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac. I demand and I, am, I should be given respect. I'm the creator. Same thing here, right? We're slaves to something. Could be Satan, could be to our lives, could be to anything else. When God is saying, I'm jealous for your hearts, be slaves to me. Be wholly devoted to me. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. You shall have no other gods before me because they can't do anything, but God can. Right, and when you serve this master, it's not like serving earthly masters. Right. You know, he's, he's perfect in every way. You know, we all love in the Bible where it talks about the servant when he's able to leave his master's house. And he decides, I don't want to leave my master's house. And so his ears, you know, pierced by being nailed to the, to the door. Right. And, and that's that idea is that, you know, we love our master. And because of that, we never want to leave. And so it, it, it makes it very unique when it applies to who God is. Because right. he's the master who is actually serving so much. Right. Steve? You have to realize, too, we sometimes forget that for 400 years, these millions of Israelites were in Egypt. And there was a Pharaoh who was ultimately in Egypt, and they had multiple gods as many as 112 gods are listed. So the, Egypt, the Israelites saw this for 400 years. Now they're taken out into the wilderness, and they're told they're wanted. Now in the one, and they, as we go, see other things <coughs> come out after. Right. Well, and, and that Pharaoh is God, right? He is uh, the, the earthly representation of God, and even to the point of like he just come, you know, he's the sun God. You know, they put themselves into that position. Um, and a lot of times they can do like even Pharaoh's thinking about like some of the, <laughs> some of the tricks that they could perform to show their power, right? And here comes God with Moses saying, you don't have power. God has power. Yeah, and, and what's interesting is this relationship is a little unique in this master relationship because the New Testament clearly teaches that although he is indeed our master, we can move out of that slave relationship and be adopted as a son and an heir right. to that. We know things intimately that the master has versus being just a slave in his house. Right, because... You know, that a lot of people will say, like, when you come to church three times a week and you just sit there, it's like, no, th there's more to that. It's not just, you know, some kind of uh, ritual that we go through. This is a family, right? We've been adopted into it. We're brothers and sisters together. The words that are used are important. Like, we're, we're talking about names and words here. Those words are important, right? Somebody says, you know, I, you know, Oh, my family's Catholic, or whatever it might be, right? I go only, you know, occasionally, right? I, there's no relationship there. At least I don't see one. Did I see a hand? Did I miss one? I mean, so make sure I don't miss any. Um, so this reminds us of our needs, our need to submit to God's authority. Um, so let's go ahead and go to Deuteronomy 10. I added, so just in the notes here, just had verse 17. But as I was reading through that, I added on to the end of the chapter uh, because I found that it really go, delves deeper into this idea, this, this, what we should be thinking about God and this, our master, our Lord. If I could have somebody read uh, 17 through 22 of Deuteronomy 10. Well, the Lord your God is a is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow and shows his love for the alien by giving him food and clothing. So show your love for the alien, for you were aliens in the land of Egypt. You shall fear 
fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done these great and awesome things for you, which your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, seventy persons in all, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. So that verse 17, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords. And I can't find my notes. Eddie, do you remember it's which God of gods? That's because I think Lord of lords is the Adonai of, you know, like it's that. And the God of gods is the, the is it the, no, not Yahweh. I left, I left my notes somewhere else on that. So that's what happens when you start going down these rabbit holes. You start making notes in other places and you forget them. <laughs> but that's what he's saying is, there is nothing else that you can compare me to. Right? He's talking about what he did for them. Executes justice for the orphan and the widow. Shows his love for the alien. Uh, because you were aliens. We come to Christ as strangers. We come to Christ broken, sinful, and he makes us whole. He helps us with that. Anything else on Adonai? Because this kind of leads us into, we got Jesus now. So I know this is kind of, you know, the question they asked, you know, of the three major names for God in the Old Testament, how many are applied to Jesus in the New Testament quotations? All of them. I mean, it seems a little too easy, but Jesus is all of them. So let's go ahead and look at these verses. Uh, we do have, we still have, we're good on time. So let's look at these verses. Uh, if I could get somebody, Hebrews 1, 8 through 9. And then if anybody else wants to pick up or at least start moving towards uh, Hebrews 1, 10. Um, and then John 8, 5, 58. And then Matthew 22. So listen for, this is again, this is all New Testament. This is about Jesus. You know, we had mentioned earlier about how when he, you know, he talked to the Pharisees and they were upset about this. And he says, I am. When he, he's talking about, he's referencing back to this point about Moses, right? Who should I tell to the Israelites, to my people? Who should I tell them is with us? You tell them, I am. And so Jesus is making that same reference of same thing, right? Elohim, let us. I was there. In the beginning was the word, right? That's me. I'm there. So anybody uh, first get uh, Hebrews 1, 8 through 9. Elohim. So Yahweh, verse 10 in Hebrews 1. And now, Lord, in the beginning, has laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the works of thy hands. <coughs> and then John 8, 58. That's that, yeah, that Yahweh, the Greek they use as the curious, Lord, Master. And then Matthew 22. He said to them, How is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. So here we have Jesus encompassing all three of these words, of these names of God, Elohim, Yahweh, Adonai. Old Testament passages using all three above names are quoted. So these, and there are others that God is talking, you know, that Jesus, he's talking about, and other writers talk about Jesus and how he's with the Father. He is part of this. Anything else about Jesus using these names or any verses you came up with? 
or that you always remember? What I always think about is in Philippians where it says at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Yeah. But what's unique about that is Jesus was a very common name. I mean, it, it was something that a lot of people were named. But the but that name carries so much more significance when we hear it. When we hear Jesus, there's only one thing that comes to mind, not the commonality, you know, among people of, of times going by. Yeah, last week we looked at one of Jesus' names, Emmanuel, right? There's that E-L on the end of it. God is with us. And that's what Jesus is, you know, he's Prince of Peace. All of these other names. I mean, we could do a whole other story about the names of Jesus. But they still coincide with God. They all match up with God. He's just a different part of that. You know, he's the son. He's that personality. He's the one that came down. But he's Emmanuel. God is with us. We have this last verse here. Psalm 8.1. And this is kind of... Uh, Another one of the verses to have as the importance. And I like, uh, you know, we put in, I put in the, uh, uh, what each one is. O Lord Yahweh. So, your name, your personal name that is to be revered. Our Lord, our Master, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You who set your glory above the heavens. Anything else uh, before we finish up on these names of God. Anything else from... Yeah, go ahead. Some, some group, uh, Francis Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, they believe in God, Jehovah, but not Jesus. Right. And interesting thing, I was teaching a class a long time ago, church over in similar to us, we bear the name Christian. And what does that mean? That means, you know, so for Jehovah's Witness, right, they're talking about God's witness here on earth, right? They're trying to employ God's, you know, judgment and his, what he wants. But we're Christian, right? Which comes with the name, I'm a disciple of Christ. I follow Christ. So that's the kind of name that we should bear. Anything else? actually got through it all. Thank you. That was, I was a little worried that I had too much information there. So I appreciate it. Um, and uh, we'll see you, Lord willing, next week.
this. Yes, my kids, I really don't need the mic, but it's good to see everybody out tonight. Before Trey's invitation, we're going to sing song 123, the 90 and 9. If you want to take this opportunity to mark the song of invitation, if you're using your books, we'll sing 251, I'm Happy Today. Hopefully all the kiddos can sing along with that one. Uh, the 99, we're going to kind of keep this up tempo and then it slows down the last two bars. <clears throat> we'll sing all five verses. For the few minutes that we have left, uh, I would like to talk about an interesting phrase in Ephesians chapter 1, if you can open your Bibles there. It's a phrase that really took me by surprise a few years ago. Um, we're going to start, it's not in verse 15, but we're going to start in verse 15 and read to verse 18. Again, that's Ephesians 1, starting in verse 15. Verse 15. 
For this reason, because I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power towards us who believe. And I'll, and I'll stop there. Uh, so here Paul, he's praying for the Ephesian church, and he prays specifically for three things. Uh, the first is that they have better knowledge of the hope to which they have been called. Uh, second is riches of his glorious inheritance, and third is immeasurable greatness of his power. These are all things that we need to better understand. And when I first read uh, a few years ago, first read that second one, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, I immediately thought, of, thought he was saying the riches of our inheritance in him, our inheritance in God, but instead it's, it's, it's the opposite of that. It's riches of his being God's inheritance in us. And I don't know how, how you feel. I don't know how you woke up this morning, but um, I don't know if any particular person wakes up thinking, wow, I am just a glorious inheritance today for God. I am just his inheritance. He is so blessed to have me. Um, and I don't think he's trying to say that here. In fact, a, a few verses later, um, in chapter 2, he, he gives the Ephesians probably some of the hardest hitting verses that have ever been spoken. And in Ephesians chapter 2, and you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, and whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. So he essentially says, you, you are, number one, you're, you're dead in your trespasses, or you were, you were following the prince of the power of the air, which is the devil in this context. You, you were following the devil, and you lived according to your own passions. You, you, were, you, were like a, you were like an animal just following whatever whim you wanted to follow. And that's really our own stories, all of our stories in sin. Uh, we were dead. We were helpless. We were following the devil. We weren't just charting our own course. We were following the devil. And then we were animals. Frankly, we were following the desires of our own flesh. And that's the people that he describes in chapter 1 as his glorious inheritance. And I just want to let that sink in. That same group in Ephesians 2 that he's described as dead, he now describes as glorious inheritance. And that's because... That's not the end of chapter 2. That's not the end of our story. That's not the end of uh, their story. Uh, because, starting in verse 4, but God, in chapter 2, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the, in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So it's not because of who we are or our innate value or maybe even the sum of our individual talents together, right? Because, but it's because of what God has done in us. We can imagine ourselves as a, a vessel that is only glorious because of what we're filled with, right? God pours into us this grace. And even in verse 7, in the coming ages, he might show us even more grace, the immeasurable riches of his grace. And because of that, because of that immeasurable grace, we are an immeasurable inheritance. We've been given so much grace that there's an endless story of glory to be told in heaven. And that's what God has to look forward to in us. Um, so I wanted to explain that to just... Because that, that's something that impacts me every time I read Ephesians. And that's something that I think should impact someone who is considering obeying the gospel tonight. You may not feel quite ready 
you may not understand right now that you could be a glorious inheritance, but because of what Christ could do in you, you could be a glorious inheritance for God. Um, so if you'd like, you can come forward in a minute, or you could talk to us after services. We'd love to help in whatever way we can. Please come forward as we stand and sing. for that lesson this evening uh, while he was talking about that I was thinking about Jesus praying uh, for his people and him saying to everything God has given him he has kept until this day and he can do that for us today as well so I, I really appreciated that uh, if you would remain standing for a closing prayer and then be seated for us the announcements to follow Let's pray. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, you are great and almighty, wonderful, and you have made each and every one of us, and we are so thankful that we are here on this earth to be able to come together this night to praise you, to worship you, to spend time in your word, and to fellowship, to be with our brethren here. We thank you for this time that we've had, and we hope that everything that we've done in this worship has been to your glory and that we can take these things on the, the names of God and those things that each of the children have studied in their classes and the lesson that was brought to us tonight and to really focus on your, your love for us and our love for you as we move into the world again tomorrow. Help us to go into it with renewed zeal, renewed fervor, and to be able to spread your word to, to everyone around us. We also pray for those that couldn't be here tonight due to sicknesses or other reasons, and we pray that at the next time they'll be able to come back, and we especially also pray at this time for Lacey and Josh as they are traveling, and please be with them, keep them safe, give them strength and courage and your love as they're going through this process, and be with the, the baby as well, and help uh, the child to be healthy and well as, as they go through this time as well. We love you so much, and we hope that we can come again on Sunday to worship you again, and we pray in all these things in your son's name. Amen. It's great to see everyone here tonight, especially the visitors. We're glad you're here tonight during this 
midweek service and classes, and we hope that you're able to help recharge your spiritual batteries for the rest of the week. Just a few announcements. In three weeks, we're going to have our first meeting here, February 2nd through the 5th. And so please mark that in your calendar, invite your friends and family and those uh, outside to come and, and join us here as we will have the uh, Tuesday through fi Friday uh, gospel meeting. And uh, if you haven't seen the email from Eddie, they're uh, possibly putting together a young adult class and restarting the Bible kids, uh, the kids Bible drill. Um, and so that will be after services and Sunday night. So get that email if you have any questions. If you don't have it, we'll get it to you. If your parents or kids would be interested, please let Eddie know. If you're interested in the young adult class, having another adult class, please let Eddie know the email went out this week. A couple that'll be uh, announcements of people that are still out of the area. J.D. Harkwright are still in Bahrain. Let's remember him and the family in our prayers. Let's remember all those still fighting COVID, coming off of also some quarantining periods, the Tidwells, Nairobi, glad to have the Kirkpatricks back with us. And so uh, let's keep our eyes and ears uh, open to see how we can help and be with those who need our help. Um, haven't heard anything about Byron McCollum's test. That's still this week. Has it happened yet? Okay. Okay, but we won't have any results yet. Byron had his test this week, and so we should hear about that. As was mentioned in the prayer, if you saw the email, some great news. Uh, Josh and Lacey Keith are packing and probably on their way to Arizona right now uh, to hopefully in a, in a short time uh, to collect Daniel Ryan Martin Keith. Um, another email also went out we want everybody to know about. There were quite a few unexpected expenses. So if you're, please, if you're able to, check out the email, help out through the service that they're going through, uh, or reach out to uh, one of the elders or the deacons to see how we can help them in that as individuals, help them out in that matter. And um, women's class will be next Tuesday, the 19th. And um, let's remember Franco Rojo's niece. Um, haven't heard any updates on that, just that they couldn't do anything more for her um, her COVID went through her system, ravaged her lungs. She can't breathe anymore, and they took her off the ventilators. Any update? Okay. That's it. That's all they can. There's nothing more they can do. So let's remember the rojos in our prayers. Let's remember all the expectant mothers and the adopted families uh, that are coming our way. Now, I mentioned Sunday. Some of you weren't here. The good news about Anthony Short having all his cancer being clear. That was just wonderful news. I forgot to mention uh, that Tony Mountain, as Rita's brother, is off the ventilator out of ICU. Now he's got to stay in the hospital a little longer, but she says he's doing a lot better and he's going to be hopefully released in five to six days, I think she said. So that's one, five to six days? Weeks? Five to, five to six weeks. He's out of ICU, but he's going to be in the hospital a lot longer. But the good news is he is recovering and I uh, wanted to share that with everybody. And also this uh, Saturday at uh, 6 p.m. will be the teen study at the building. I wanted to mention that. After the uh, memory verse, Eddie's going to come up here, and we're going to have a special prayer on the keys' behalf. So we'll say the memory verse now. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Ephesians 5.11. Let's pray. Our God, it is indeed a privilege to be able to come before your throne, to know that you are the everlasting God who, before time began, you always existed. We're so thankful, Father, throughout all the ages your people have been able to call upon you and know that not only do you hear, but you are the God who sees, the God who cares, the God who is all-sufficient, the God who grants, Father, and the Lord who shows mercy. We're so grateful for the news that the Keiths will now be able to uh, have an addition to their family. And Father, we're in awe that such a, um, a child that was born after only 26 weeks, Father, is able to enter into the world and show just how you created us, Father. We are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. We pray, dear God, that you bless uh, little Daniel, help him to grow stronger each and every day, keep him healthy, be with the Keiths as they're traveling, and keep them safe upon the roads. We pray, dear Father, that as we seek to reach out to them to help, that these things will not only help them in the physical realm, but especially the emotional struggles that they'll go through over the next several days. We pray, dear Father, that you help us always to lean upon you for our um, 
for all that we need in life and for even life itself. Please, Father, help us to put you first and to show others just how truly great and awesome it is to serve you. We pray all these things in the name of your Son.